Hello. How's everybody doing? All right. Today we're, uh, as Jen said, back in Colossians, and we're in Colossians chapter 3. And I'm going to teach today on the subject of forbear and forgive. Forbear and forgive. Now, in the first paragraph that Jen read, verses 1 through 4, we see that we have died to a life ruled by sin. First of all, you cannot become a Christian unless that happens. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you must deny yourself, take up your cross, death, and then come and follow me. So we have died to our old life ruled by sin, and we have been raised to a new life ruled by Christ. And our focus now is on the crucified, resurrected, ascended Jesus who rules over our life in the kingdom of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. That's who we are. And then in the second paragraph, it refers to as our minds are put on things above, we put to death things below. That, that means the attitudes and behaviors which belong to the old nature, the earthly nature apart from Christ, before Christ. Some examples, rage, malice, profanity, lies are listed there. Then we come to the uh, climactic paragraph, if you will, in verse 12 through 14. And we are stru- instructed to clothe ourselves with Christ. We've died to ourselves. We've given our life to him. So clothe yourselves with Christ. In other words, put off the old, put on the new. Tomorrow, put off the old, put on the new. Tomorrow afternoon, put off the old. Put on. It's, it's a lifestyle of putting off the old the way we used to live in our own ways, in our own power, and now we live in the ways of Jesus and his power. So um, Paul lists a few of these uh, characteristics that will be displayed, compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience. And why do we clothe ourselves with Christ? And why do we walk in these characteristics? Because in verse 13... So we will forbear and forgive. Let's read that verse again. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. So forbear and forgive are two paramount ways that we extend the love of Christ from the new nature in us as Christians to others around us, be it Christians or those who are not Christians. So let's start with forbear, and then later we're going to move into the part about forgiveness. The word forbear, uh, an echo in Greek, means to endure, to put up with, to forbear. Now, for years, um, I would sit down on Sunday night, and I would schedule my week. Any schedulers out there? Okay. Okay. Six. I think we outnumber the first service. There were four. So, okay. Um, so I would sit down and I would develop this beautiful schedule. Um, I mean, it was uh, neat, orderly, organized. It was like a paper GPS. And it told me where I needed to be, who I needed to talk to, where I needed to go, and, um, you know, what it was about. So, as in the words of the great theologian Andy Reid, upon winning the Super Bowl... It was a beautiful thing. My schedule was perfect, right? So here I am in my OCD personality. And um, then I turned to Bev and I said, well, let's schedule your week. And um, well, she, in my opinion at the time, was unorganized because she was unscheduled. Boo, I know. Um, so I decided as a good husband, I would help her and we would sit down and form a schedule for her for that week. Isn't that kind? (laughs) Dangerous. (laughs) So we would do this week after week after week. 
And somehow, um, as I'm trying to plan every half hour of the rest of her life, it's not working. <laughs> and I finally came to a revelation. She didn't want to schedule. <laughs> she was spontaneous. I was the one that was more scheduled. So I realized I needed to drop my expectation of her. She was not wired like me. I was not wired like her. She had already accepted the way I did things. She was fine if I scheduled everything out. Why wasn't I fine if she didn't schedule everything out? Her personality was different. So it did happen. She accepted me first, then I accepted her way of being, doing things. And it's forbearance. We're just different from each other. And so we forbear with the way other people do things versus the way that we do things. It's a relational win-win when we forbear with each other because we're not after each other or trying to provoke each other or trying to get each other to do something just the way we do it. And most of all, it's putting off the old nature that's critical, that gets uh, all, you know, bent out of shape unduly uh, just because someone is a different human than us. Let me give you one other example uh, quickly of family uh, forbearance because in your family is probably the best place and the easiest and quickest, hopefully for you, the quickest place to learn forbearance. So we're traveling to Pennsylvania as we did annually when we were younger and we had our three children uh, with her each each time and we're going along in our van and we stop at that great um, Bob Evans restaurant. Okay, Any, anybody ever eat at a Bob Evans? I'm sorry. Okay, anyway, uh, it, it was cheap, but it wasn't always the greatest. Anyway, so we went there and um, we're um, sitting there at the table. I'm on this side and Micah, our youngest at the time, three years old, is on this side, okay? And Micah was wearing those uh, cheap plastic sandals. Do they still sell those? The kind that stick to your feet when you sweat and they're hard to get off? Okay, they do. So he had those on, and for whatever reason, um, he was trying to get one of his sandals off. And so he's on this side of the table, and I'm on that side of the table, and he's down there fidgeting with his sandal, you know, and so finally he just flips it off, and it ascends toward the light fixture in the restaurant. And before it hits it, it plummets down onto my side of the table and lands in the middle of my spaghetti. Yeah, that's what everybody in the restaurant thought. Uh, and so I'm looking at his sandal in the middle of my spaghetti, and I'm going, this kid's going to be a great pitcher. Bev was not thinking about baseball at the time, but we both laughed because he was just trying to get his sandal off. And as parents, we had to learn, as all parents do, hopefully, that um, you forbear with your children in, in, in many ways. And if you don't, and you move into disciplining them for just accidents or mistakes, then you develop, you help them develop a black and white mentality about life, which leads to shame. That's not in my message. Okay. I just felt like I needed to say that. Because I grew up dealing with shame. Because too much weight was put on certain things that didn't need that weight. Are you with me? Uh, Bev reminded me uh, in between services that when we left the restaurant, there was an older couple, which now would be our age, <laughs> um, that commended us for the way we dealt with the sandal in the spaghetti sauce. They had the experience, they had the wisdom as older people to know when you discipline and when you don't. So that was pretty cool. 
Well, in scripture, forbearance deals with four different things. Preferences, opinions, weaknesses, and differences. We put up with how dissimilar other people are to ourselves. That's why we have scriptures like Romans 15, 7, which says, accept one another then, just as Christ has accepted you. Let me give you a biblical illustration of this. The apostle Paul mentored Timothy, a young man, and Timothy became mature, certainly mature enough to become a leader in the New Testament church. And um, so he was a, a great person, mentored by the great apostle Paul, and of great maturity. However, Timothy had a weakness, a human weakness. He would sometimes fall into his propensity to fear, to be afraid, to get anxious, to be apprehensive, whatever you want to call it. And so we see when Paul wrote to Timothy personally in 2 Timothy 1.7, he said to, uh, to Timothy, for God did not give us a spirit of fear, Timothy, but a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. It's no surprise then when Paul writes to the Corinthian church anticipating the arrival of Timothy in Corinth. And he writes to the Corinthian church and he says, now if Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he's with you. For he's carrying on the work of the Lord just as I am. No one then should refuse to accept him. 1 Corinthians 16, 10, and 11. So Paul exhorts the Corinthians to forbear with the weakness of his protege, Timothy. He didn't put Timothy down for being human. Rather, he did everything he could in his power and in the power of the Corinthian church in this case to remove anything that would cause a stumbling block. For Timothy. You see the love in that? Walt Emerson once said, what lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us. Do you know what lies within us? It's just what we've been talking about. It's our new nature in Christ. Our Christ-like Love uh, what allows us to choose forbearance in any and all circumstances. Put up with each other. Endure each other. Now, something very, very, very important. Turn to your neighbor and say, this is very important. <laughs> okay. Forbearance is not about sin. It's about living as imperfect human beings in an imperfect world alongside other imperfect human beings. See, there's a line of humanity throughout life that sometimes is glossed over by overzealous preachers and teachers and rigid black and white people that says, okay, everything's uh, good, or evil, everything's right or wrong. Every, and pe some people throw humanity out the window and everything is so super spiritual here or super spiritual down there. But I think it's a disservice to the Christian church to not understand how we deal with our humanity and how we can understand each other. I mean, Jesus came to earth to understand us. He took on humanity. Why don't we talk about that more in churches? I think people are uncomfortable speaking about it. It's easy to say everything's good or everything's bad. It's a little more complicated to forge through the fact we're human beings and we make mistakes and we have accidents and things happen that are not necessarily spiritual. And we forbear with each other about those things. So 
There are people in your life that irritate you because they do something different. Um, you, there are people in your life that you're bound to disagree with at home, at work, or wherever. But the bottom line is that forbearance endures human preferences, human opinions, human differences, and human weaknesses. By choosing at any given moment to put on, to clothe ourselves with that nature of Christ. Let's consider uh, forbearance uh, through the lens of culture for a few moments. Um, the first time I ever traveled to the South, um, Southwest in particular, uh, from Pennsylvania where I'm from, um, we uh, were going through, I think it was Southern Oklahoma, and we walked into a restaurant and the gal said, how y'all doing? How all y'all doing? And I'm looking around like, who's the all y'all? <laughs> you know, it's just, it just me standing there wanting to order. But anyway, um, it's a cultural difference. Now, it didn't take long to just kind of laugh about that and accept it rather than just think, oh, wait. They talk weird here. Uh, and so the same thing happens when, when then we go overseas. And if you go to France, where my daughter, oldest daughter lived and worked for a while, uh, you may need to get ready to uh, forbear or accept the fact that you might get kissed on this cheek and this cheek just being greeted. But you get used to it, at least. I haven't been there, so that's what I hear. <laughs> and then uh, if you go to India or Japan and there's bowing, then that's a cultural difference. And how could we, I mean, we easily accept those things, really. So why don't we easily accept the differences in our humanity right here? But let me give you one where there's really an extra challenge, and that's the Serrano people, the Serrano people who live in South America. Now, the Serrano people uh, greet each other, just man to man now, okay, man to man. When they greet each other, they spit on each other's chest. I'm not recommending it here at New Wine Church, <laughs> but that's their culture. That's the way they do things. So, uh, if I reach out my hand to shake your hand this morning and you spit on my chest, we're going to have culture clash. Right? But if I move to South America and join the Serrano people, I better get used to spitting just as I've been spitted upon. Right? Because that's the way they do things there. Another uh, cultural one, and this is for anyone who wants to do ministry, especially overseas, my wife has been to Haiti uh, 25 times or more, and um, she's taken teams with her, and they've been awesome, great servant uh, leaders, prayer people, and so on and so on. But once in a while, there's someone on a team that will raise a question. And I'm just going to give you uh, one, one example. Um, so why is that car, a really old car, broken down, not running, ugly, sitting out there in the patio area. Now, Bev could say, just hold that thought. Let's get some electricity on if we can. Let's see if we can get the internet working if we can. And let's see if I can get on my phone and just dial up the three closest tow services. There are no tow services. <laughs> so Bev had the opportunity to learn to forbear with some of the people that she took to Haiti who had Western world views in a third world country. And I don't know that it was delightful immediately <laughs> each time that happened, but she learned to do it and to love them and to understand that they were not getting it. 
and that was okay because they were so Americanized, it was difficult. Okay, Jesus, of course, was the best and the greatest example of forbearing with people. And I hate to use Peter as an example because he's been kind of abused <laughs> in a lot of sermons over the years. Uh, but Peter did have some idiosyncrasies like uh, forgetfulness, being opinionated, and so on and so on. But um, let me just read uh, quickly one situation where Jesus uh, was forbearing with Peter. It was a transfiguration, and after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and led them up on a high mountain. There he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became white as light. Just then there appeared before them Moses and Elijah talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I'll put up three shelters. I'll start building things. I'll start making trophies. I'll honor you. I'll honor Elijah. I'll honor Moses. I'll, I'll do all this stuff. And while he was still speaking, a bright cloud enveloped them. And a voice from the cloud said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell face down, terrified. But Jesus came and touched them and said, get up, don't be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus. You see, just before this amazing transfiguration, Jesus had been talking to the disciples. Uh, You can check this out in Matthew 16, and including Peter. And he said to them, what do you gain if uh, if you gain the whole world? What good is it? If you forfeit your soul. He talked to them about dying to themselves. Losing their life. And Peter hadn't fully grasped that idea. And so when this transfiguration happened, he was ready to go to work and do things that God had no intention for him to do. You see, this was an all-encompassing revelation of Jesus Christ. The fulfillment of the law, Moses, and the prophets, Elijah. God was wanting Peter, James, and John on that mountain to see the glory of Jesus. Not do things for him. So Jesus put up with the preferences, opinions, weaknesses, and differences of Peter. But as Jesus loved Peter through these times, putting up with him, Peter matured. And Peter eventually became one of the three leaders of the Jerusalem church, which was the central leadership for all of the Acts church. You see what? living out of the nature of Christ can do for other people. It's not just us putting off the old and putting on the new. It's giving that new to other people and then they grow and they become all that God wanted them to be. But if we write them off, now listen closely, if we write them off, how are they going to grow up in Christ? So that person that annoys you may be the person that you need to uh, just keep giving them love. Keep giving them love. Let's transition to forgiveness. There's a distinct difference between forbearance and forgiveness. Whereas forbearance applies grace to human differences. Forgiveness applies grace to spiritual disobedience. This is so critical for your spiritual understanding. We need to be people of discernment, and 1 Corinthians tells us that spiritual people discern spiritual things, right? So we need to be able to discern forbearance versus forgiveness, and here it is kind of a a line drawn in the sand, if you will. Let me give you an example. Okay, so let's say a a person's talking about you to a friend, and they say, you know, I don't like the way he or she asserts their opinions. 
Okay, you find out about that. So what? That's their vantage point. That's, that's their opinion. <laughs> what do you do? You don't have to do anything. They're just being a human person who has a human opinion about another human. Big deal. If you can't live with that, you need to leave the earth right now. <laughs> because it's going to happen again and again and again throughout your life. People are going to say things that you don't like. They're going to do things you don't like. They're going to have an attitude you don't like. Forbear with them. Now, let's take it to the next level. So, let's say they go on in their conversation with their friend about you and say, you know, the way they assert their opinions, I don't really like it. And you know what? I don't think they care about people. In fact, I don't think they really love people at all. Whoa. Now we're moving out of the arena of forbearance and into the arena of forgiveness. Because they are slandering your character, saying that you don't love people. That's different than saying I don't really care about their opinion so much. Right? This, go, this is a lot deeper now and it demands deeper grace. So we're not talking about just a difference, if you will, but we're talking about disobedience. Someone accusing you about your character. That's sinful. Love one another. Honor one another. We could go on. So the accusation will not only cause deeper hurt than the little hurt you might have had if you heard about just the first part, but it will demand deeper grace, and that's the grace of forgiveness. Now, Paul uses the word grievance in verse 13 to depict relational sin that necessitates forgiveness. Um, grievance exceeds matters of preference, opinion, weakness, and differences. And it moves into the realm of disregarding scriptural commands. A grievance can engender quarreling in your family, your office, your school, whatever, dissension. It can bring about disunity. And that disunity can spread even in a church throughout the entire church. I've seen that happen in early days of ministry. So here's another distinction for you. Forbearance is for minor abrasions. And forgiveness is for major wounds. Okay? Everybody with me? You're, you're going to have abrasions. I run into the woodwork on our... Um, I shouldn't say this, really. It sounds bad. Uh, I run into the woodwork in our walls and hit my smartwatch. You, get, you know, you could get an abrasion. There's no big deal. There's no need for uh, forgiveness when you get an abrasion. I don't say, oh, I forgive you, Kim, for running into the wall. <laughs> it's, it's just a little accident. A major wound occurred when Jacob took the birthright of Esau. Esau was the older of the twins. He deserved the birthright, but he gave it up. He traded it in to Jacob for a meal when he was hungry. And so later, um, his father gave the blessing to Jacob instead of Esau when Jacob conspired with his mother and pretended to be Esau. It's a long story, but the bottom line is this. Esau hated his brother Jacob. Genesis 27, 41 says, Then Esau held a grudge against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given him, and he said, I will kill my brother Jacob. We're far away from forbearance now. We're deep into forgiveness. Genesis 33 describes the, the amazing scene. Jacob, after, I think it was three years, Jacob comes... Esau comes here, and Esau has 400 men with him. What's going to happen? As you read it, you anticipate Jacob's going to be wiped out. And then something 
almost unbelievable happens. Esau runs to his brother Jacob, throws his arms around him, kisses him, and they weep together. What happened? Esau realized he could not undo what was done. All he could do was cancel the debt in his own heart. His hurt had graduated into hate and he had one choice left. Forgiveness. Do you know that forgiveness is always available? Come on. Forgiveness is always available. You may not find mutual understanding with someone. You may have your, uh, your respect or their respect damaged. You may have broken trust in a relationship, but there's always forgiveness. It's the bottom line of love. You can always forgive no matter what has happened and how deep and major the wound. Jesus did it for you and me. And he gave us his nature so we can do it for others. William Arthur Ward wrote this, we are more like beasts when we kill, we are more like men when we judge, and we are more like God when we forgive. How do we forgive when we're hurt so deeply by someone? Colossians 3.13, the end, it ends with, forgive as the Lord forgave you. We recall grace. Be kind and compassionate to one another and forgive each other. Even as in Christ, God forgave you, Paul wrote to the Ephesians. Well, let, let me share one illustration before we draw this to an end. And um, as I said in the first service, I've never shared this before, but this is the second time <laughs> because this is the second service. So as a pastor for uh, 40 years, um, as a Christian for even longer, I've experienced many things that people don't know about because you just can't get up and start talking about something that happened last week that somebody did to you <laughs> or said to you or whatever. And uh, this is good for you to understand because you have pastors and leaders that, um, that you need to relate with um, very healthily. Well, as a pastor for many years, I worked on, in large churches and the one that I started became very large and, and was the leader of that for 30 years. And uh, I had many, many associate pastors over the years. And we had a large staff, so we had many even at one time. Um, so, um, one of the pastors I, I, I really wanted to get to know better outside the office, uh, who was the newest associate pastor on staff at that time. And so I would ask him to do things and they just didn't seem to have time um, to get together or so on. At any rate, um, so he gets a call from a church in another city and they ask him if he would like to interview for senior leadership of a large and growing church in, in this other city. Um, so he asked me for a day off, but he didn't tell me about it. And I just, you know, he wants a day off, great, take a day off. So he went to that city and had the interview again without telling me anything about this. And then uh, that went well. And he came home and he processed the whole decision with our closest friends behind our back and met with our friends who were 20 to 30 years, we were closest friends. And they prayed together and they talked together and they made a decision together and we were totally clueless. There are a lot of betrayals that occur in life. And sometimes even your pastors 
are betrayed and there's major wounding. I hope that that never happens to our pastors here, but if it does, understand that they are human too. But the most important thing, the bottom line here, is that I, I, I didn't have any understanding of the situation because no one ever said anything to me. I lost respect for this person. Trust was broken. How could I trust someone who does this behind my back with my best friends? Would you trust a person that did that? I don't think it's smart to trust a person who does that. Not unless they, you come to reconciliation, which is a whole other sermon <laughs> beyond forgiveness. So I had one choice left. I couldn't undo what was done, could I? I couldn't. So he asked me one day to go do something fun. And um, I thought, wow, I've been wanting to become, you know, more brotherly and stuff outside the office. This will be cool. So we went and did something. And I'm keeping this generic so no one knows who this was. And we had fun. And I was feeling really good. And then as we're getting in cars separately, he said, I have something I need to tell you. I'm leaving and taking this position in this city. I really don't think he knew how that could hurt so deeply. But there's such a thing as self-deception, right? And that's how these things happen. Because we're not working out of the new nature at that point. We're working out of whatever's going to work for us. A new job, a senior leadership, big church, growing church, a city I like, da 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 da. So I couldn't undo what was done, but forgiveness is in my new nature. And it covered the betrayal. I can hug this person, hug their spouse, talk to them when I see them, wherever, at a wedding or, you know, whatever. Forgiveness. It's freedom. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is a mentor of mine. Um, He's a, he was a theologian in Germany who uh, was part of the resistance in World War II. And he, as a result, he was imprisoned and executed. And a major influence in my life from his tremendous uh, writings. Even as a young person, he was executed and had uh, completed these writings that are books that are awesome. So if you ever want to read something great, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Um, but he describes forgiveness from his perspective. And this is what he said. Uh, this was before, obviously, um, everything uh, happened because there was a series of things that took place. But he was teaching on forgiveness one time. He said, through prayer, we go to our enemies, we stand by their side, and we plead for them to God. Jesus has not promised they will not despitefully use us or persecute us, but not even that can overcome us. If we pray for them, we are doing vicariously for them what they cannot do for themselves. What a statement. If we pray for them, we are doing vicariously for them what they cannot do for themselves. You see, they're deceived. Obviously, Hitler was deceived. Whatever situation he was talking about here before he was imprisoned, he knew that people are deceived and they do things and they cause major wounds. And he goes on to say every insult they utter only serves to bind us more closely to God and to them. How is that, how, how is that possible? It's possible because we draw more closely to people that wound us when we forgive them because there's no deeper love than canceling spiritual debt. 
forgiveness. And we draw closer to God and become more like God when we forgive because we suffer as Jesus did on the cross in justice. So forgiveness has great benefits. You are freed. You're more like the Lord himself. Therefore, we are as close to Jesus as we are to our enemies. So two questions this morning. With whom do you need to forbear? Probably everybody, right? We all have our stuff. We all have our mannerisms and so forth. Lots of people can annoy us. On the highway, in the office, in the family. And who do you need to forgive? For some, it's a parent who didn't show them the love they needed. For some, it's a spouse who betrayed you. For some, it's a church that's wounded you. For some, it's a friend who lied about you. For some, it's a sibling who scarred you. For some, it's a family member who abandoned you. And for some, it's simply an authoritative person in your life, an authority figure who said, you'll never amount to anything. Yep, those people are in New Wine Church. Those people are in every church. Let's pray as the worship team comes up. Before I pray, I want to encourage you, if there's a forbearance or forgiveness situation, come up and pray with those who will be up here after the worship team concludes. Lord, we love you so much. Thank you for this time of worship today. Thank you that uh, your word is alive and well, and it motivates us and stimulates us to release the new nature of Christ in us toward everyone, whether it's a minor abrasion or a major wound. We get the opportunity to love even as we have been loved. And for that, Lord, we say thank you. May we be faithful as you are always faithful to us. For the sake of Christ, amen.